Okay, um, all set up on the technical side. Let's let's get going with the next module. Um, this is a uh, you know a two-part sec oh, section really a uh, time series. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of you know linear trend fitting and harmonic trend fitting, and uh, then some change detection algorithms too. This is going into a, a lot more technical detail than the, the talks so far have, have been doing. Uh, there'll be real mathematics. And uh, it's also going to be a bit of an exercise in, in reading code. The, the, the code examples are, you know, I'll be presenting them you know, 10 lines at a time. But they are, you know, a bit harder to read and in fact it's kind of an exercise, you'll find it's an exercise in translating mathematical notation to earth engine notation. Uh, and there'll be a few examples of that as, as we go through. I'll start with the, uh, the time series. Here. <coughs> We're going to be working with um, a Landsat time series. Landsat 8 has about 64 images since its launch in 20. 13, um, something every two weeks. Um, we'll do the, the linear modeling and the harmonic modeling examples um, on, on the uh, Earth Engine tutorial website. I think there, there are, this, this presentation actually goes a whole lot further into covariance and autoregressive models too. Um, I'm going to use my time to talk about change detection instead. Um, linear modeling first. So this is the time series um, at you know, a particular region of interest. I think this is in the San Francisco Bay Area, in fact. Um, it looks like there's some you know, seasonal variation, perhaps. It looks like there's some gaps in the data. Uh, our modeling technique has to be able to work with all of that. Um, and, you know, just straight off using the Google Charts library, you can say, plot the trend. Hello. Is that going to work? Yeah, because the, the mic uh, in the, the board that's doing this. The mic is getting a bit of a ring, okay. um, but it, it, it's if you yeah. can fix it, that's great. But I think it's okay, okay now. Okay. Yeah. Sure. You can turn this one off. Yes, yes, we can do that. Is it, is it? Oh, this. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a display cable, but this is the mic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just, just press the button, and then it's yes. That's not going to work. Press the button with conviction. <laughs> Screw the button back in, then press the button. Okay. okay. That's strange. That's it. That'll be okay. We will use. Check it on mic. There. Right. Yes. How's that? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. High tech solution. High tech solution. Hackery always works. Yes. Yeah, my, my <laughs> evening. Um, the, um, the time of time are not viewable by everyone. Not viewable by. Okay. Yeah, um, so yeah. the okay. I, I will have to find out what I didn't set. Okay. Yeah. That's odd. Um, Okay, so I can plot a line visually, but uh, I, I want to actually get, um, you know, intercept and slope parameters for that line. In fact, this is a single point on the map. I want to get, you know, a slope value for, for all points, all pixels on the map. Okay, I, I told you there would be math. Um, if our uh, time series, the yeah, NDVI value is a function of time, we can write it as a linear function you know, a beta zero and a beta one plus some error term. Um, this is a general linear form. Um, and, you know, stolen from a textbook, you can always write a linear equation as a matrix multiplication like that. Your, your y value, which might be a vector of y values, <coughs> is a matrix of x values times the, uh, you know, the parameters that you wanted to find y, y, beta is what we want to find, it'll be an error term too. Um, in this case, our x is just the first <laughs> two columns of this matrix here. We have to put a, a constant value in so that we get 
the beta zero term and the second column will be just the time for i so you know if we look at this form here pointing with the mouse we'll have a bunch of ndvi values in this matrix and for each <coughs> ndvi value we'll have the corresponding time value going down this column here and we'll have just two columns the rest won't be here and we're then solving this matrix equation and in fact it'll be an approximate solution for the beta values and you go back to your textbooks and you find this form which is it's called a matrix pseudo inverse um, multiply that pile of matrices by the y and you get your beta this is all done automatically by the, the linear regression model in the earth engine I just wanted to give a <coughs> background here so okay that's the math side let's let's translate it to the code side um, the first step is to um, create image bands for the values which we're going to use as variables in this analysis we had the NDVI value we had the uh, the time value and we also need to add a, a third band which is the actual constant band to the image um, and yes all these calculations are happening here the NDVI is done with um, the usual sentinel NDVI calculation um, renamed we haven't seen renamed before but the band name is now going to be changed to NDVI rather than ND which it comes out by default and we've decided to express the time in years so we had to do a bit of uh, arithmetic here to get the time from the image and do a date difference operation to subtract the date from 1970 from the date this difference operation takes a second parameter to say what unit you want the difference in yeah you want the number to be a, a number of years or a number of months or a number of days uh, you can specify as a second parameter there so that gives us uh, the time in years um, the other bit on the end is just to make sure that the image all gets stored in consistent floating point format I'm converting all these values which may have been integers or uh, maybe lower precision floats into a consistent float type so that the, the arithmetic performs um, I'm copying this example from uh, Nick Clinton on the Earth Engine team I, I do not know why the what will go wrong when I, if I don't do the floats uh, conversion there um, try it and see I'll, I'll show you the source code soon okay that, that's the first step is to add, add the extra you know bands to each pixel in the image those bands are called from the previous slide uh, constant T and, and NDVI the constant and the T are the, the independent variables in which the, the NDVI prediction is going to depend and the, the NDVI is the only dependent variable um, the magic call is you know two parts to it you've got to take your Landsat image and select down just the bands that you need for the regression and they must be in this order it must be all the independent variables followed by all the dependent variables um, and then regression is actually a reducer it, it fits the pattern of reduces exactly you've got a, a stack of images and you're compressing it down to a single not a single number but a pair of numbers in this case for uh, for the reg linear regression and you give it the number of independent variables and you give it the number of dependent variables which matches what you put in the image to begin with um, the last step is you know a little bit of magic which you know if you've worked with uh, pandas or numpy or r or any other you know package which supports matrices you often have to reform your matrices uh, the, the value that comes out of the linear regression is uh, a two-dimensional array kind of a column form two-dimensional array of an a parameter and a b parameter you want to reform it into a, a one-dimensional array and there's an array project operation with you know arguments are always have to look up uh, but you, you figure out which dimension you want to project and in this case it converts it to a one-dimensional array like this there's also a second 
flattened operation which labels each value in this array with the names which I gave it in independence at the top here. So what you end up with is you know, a labeled array, very much like you have a labeled array in R or anything else, <coughs> labeled exactly as um, we had in the, you know, to, to match up with the, the two um, band names we were using as independent variables. And we need to do this uh, to read on to the code in the next step. Okay, before I get to the next step, okay, this, this is the final result I, I want to perform is if we had the original time series seems to be slightly trending upwards. Just, just, just for example purposes, we want to see what residuals are in the data once we've removed the trend from the data. So it, we'll compute the 10, we'll, we'll subtract that from the, the original NDVI values and we'll get the actual variation from the trends and again it looks like annual variation. <coughs> to compute that subtraction, um, this is you know one of those examples of converting from mathematical notation into earth engine notation. There's a lot to read here but let's just focus on the yellow stuff. We're taking the independent <coughs> variables um, which is the constant and the time value, and we're multiplying them by the coefficients we just found from the regression. Uh, and this is why I had this step here of labeling those coefficients exactly the same as the independent variables. Um, so that it's multiply, can multiply the appropriately named things, the, the constant independent variable by the constant coefficient, uh, uh, and similarly. Um, Multiply and then apply another reducer. Let's get that out of the way. Another reducer, which is the sum. Okay, so this is you know better known as a dot product. Uh, writing it in dot product notation is actually you know I think far more readable than, than the Earth Engine notation. Um, there are just just as an aside. Um, matrix operations in the Earth Engine image library as well. You can look at the docs on image. I could have also expressed this as, as a, a matrix multiplication, you know, very much like the, that slide I had before. Um, so get your columns and rows set up the right way. You can do it as a matrix multiply instead of a dot product. Um, either way should work. Um, the last thing I'm doing, two last things I'm doing are the subtraction. So I've taken the dependent variable and I'll subtract the uh, dot product expression. The last thing I'm doing then is copy properties, is going back to the original image which had you know, a time field uh, attached to every image in the stack. I got lost in the course of doing the, the regression and in fact I had time in years and I want to go back to time in the regular date format so I, I can copy from another uh, from the original image in this case, I can copy the time back in. And the reason why I'm going to need that is so that I can plot a chart with the right axes. Um, this chart, in fact, get the original time field back. Let, let's switch from slides back into code. Uh, the, the best link uh, I'm going to take from here. Okay, sorry, I don't want the time detection, I want the time series. So that this code was separated out on a slide-by-slide -slide basis. Uh, but here's the add variables as I was describing it. The one thing I didn't describe was there's an extra function I've defined up top to do cloud masking. Um, it's worth looking at just briefly. Instead of doing medians and other operations that I was showing yesterday, the uh, Landsat collection has a bunch of quality bands and some you know bit arithmetic you can do to uh, where NASA has done a best determination of what is cloud, what is cloud shadow. You can use those bits to create a mask and uh, 
mask out the, those bits in the image. Um, this is perhaps uh, less accurate than doing a median over multiple images, but because we wanted to do a time series using every image to fit, fit the curve, um, we, we do the alternative approach and uh, don't confuse you know, combined points from multiple, combined images from multiple points in time. And uh, just drop the images, drop those pixels in the image if we determine they're too cloudy to use. The charting library is um, very large and flexible. Um, it borrows from uh, GVIS. It's a standard Google visualization library, which is the same one actually which is used in uh, Google Spreadsheets and, and other Google products. Um, we've wrapped that in a, a couple of Earth Engine specific operations. Um, so for example, you can give just a uh, an image collection to the charting library directly saying I want to plot this image collection at a given point of interest and the rest is details that you can best get from reading other people's code uh, there are many different tweaks and fiddles you can put on the charts upsetting you know point sizes and line reach and, and adding a trend line um, Copy and paste is the best way to learn the stuff. There, if you read the charting library documentations, there are, are dozens of different ways you can configure your chart. Uh, I'm printing that chart just, <coughs> just over here. And the charting library gives you a little bit of interactivity and hover and click support as well. Then the, the meat of the code was, as I described, um, setting up the uh, independence and dependent variables and doing the, the linear regression operation. Uh, and then the subtraction straight off. We do exactly the same charting kind of call with now a detended calculation. And that is there. I, I am not getting to the map yet. So the results here are just at that point the original time series and the detrended time series. OK, that, that is all the bits you need to put together to do uh, linear modeling. The, the harmonic modeling case is going to build on this basic framework. And in fact, it, it reuses a lot of this code. Uh, any questions about the, the linear modeling before I, I move on? Yes? Uh, well, when you're talking about time, yeah. Yeah. So, system yeah, time. system time, yes. System time sounds yeah. So, um, all images have a, a property called system time. Um, there are one or two. Uh, system level properties, time start and ID and other things which are applied to um, most images and, and features and objects like that. Uh, time start is measured in uh, seconds. Seconds from 1970 is a pretty standard way uh, that, that many applications work with time. And um, our charting libraries, for example, expect time to be provided in that format. So the, the reason for this, this copy properties operation is to put back what was there before, oh, yeah, after we've done the regression. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if I completely answered your question. Okay. That's good. Okay, moving on to harmonic modeling. This, this time series, modulo a bit of noise, looked like it had a, an annual variation to it. Uh, let's do a bit of mathematics again. Um, <laughs> instead of fitting a linear black line to this model, we're going to add some more terms to the, the equation of this line, 
which is basically a sine or a cosine curve, which is going to have some particular amplitude, that's going to be the one parameter, and it's going to have some particular phase, which is the other parameter. And the phase is, you know, on the x-axis, on the time axis, essentially the difference between some point in the year, January 1st, and the peak value in the harmonic series. So as you change the phase, the peak will happen in the springtime or, or, or later in the year. We can express this. Ooh, exciting mathematics. Express this. Okay, you can know the bottom half of the slide for now. Um, just look at the first line. The NDVI is, again, got a linear term. These two are just as before. This is the new term. We've got an amplitude and um, also ignore the scaling here, but it's some cosine of time, some cosine of time minus another parameter was the phase. So as you change that phase parameter phi, it's going to move the time series left and right on the x-axis. Um, so that, this will be the phi parameter here. Um, subtracting phi from time is, is going to move the line back and forth. So if, if things were easy, we'd have an equation in these four parameters and we could just solve it. The, the tricky bit here is, you know, this is, these are nice linear multipliers, beta 1, beta 2, beta 0, and uh, the amplitude. This phi is very inconveniently sitting inside the cosine. And this means that phi is not just a simple linear multiplier of time or even a linear multiplier of some function of time. It it's, it's, needs to be untangled from the mathematics in a sense. Um, and again, you know, either you remember your trig from high school or you go back to the textbooks. And there's an identity we can use here which takes this phi and function of time out of the cosine and gives you a, a beta 2 and a beta 3 instead. You will see inside each of these now, it's just a function of time with no other you know, parameters that we have to estimate inside that function. <laughs> um, substitute this into that. Um, the, the beta is written like as a function, converting the, the amplitude and the phi to the beta. You can also convert back from the betas to the amplitude and the phi. Um, the little omega parameter here, omega is the usual notation for angular frequency, um, we're not going to work with here. We're going to assume that our particular time series has annual variation and we're not going to solve for the, the period of the variation. If you did want to solve for the, the period of the variation, if for some reason your plants were flowering every four and a half months, I, I don't know, um, you could set uh, omega as a variable as well. Having done the substitution, you end up with a much nicer looking equation just in four of these beta parameters. We can compute time and these functions of time pretty, pretty conveniently. Okay, uh, enough mathematics for one slide. Um, the same kind of pattern again now. The, the term, the harmonic term is written as you know, using these two betas and Magically, the sum of a cosine and a sine ends up with another cosine curve, but shifted through the wonders of trigonometry. <coughs> now we can sw switch back into the, the comforts of code, and in fact, this looks remarkably like the linear regression um, that we were looking at before. We've set up a different set of independent variables where we have the constant and time as before, and a cosine and a sine parameter in addition to that, which we're going to need to compute and, and add to the image. So we can add it to the image using this kind of map pattern, map and add bands, which should, should be pretty familiar at this point. The time is expressed in, in radians so that the cosine and the sine work with the right frequency. Um, I said before that the omega is one. If you had a different value of omega, if you had a biannual cycle or something like that, you'd have an extra multiplication in here as well. You take the cosine of time um, and uh, 
yes, reading all these bits of earth edge and notation, you, you know, in, in many other languages, you, we, we would perform the cosine operation by saying cosine parenthesis times radians. Here we do this, this backwards postfix notation of saying time radians dot cosine. Um, it's a little bit ugly, but you get used to it, I suppose, is the best way of explaining it. Um, and then we're renaming those to cosine and sine to, to match those there. Now we have an image with all four of those independent variables in. We can do the same pattern for linear regression. Select them out, add a dependent variable, and give the right number of independent variables to the, the linear regression operation. We're now going to get out a set of four coefficients instead of two, uh, but this is going to behave in the same way after that. So, yes, we're going to take those four coefficients to the same array reforming um, for those four coefficients. And then we're going to build an image um, with that dot product happening again. Select those, multiply by the coefficients. And now the uh, image is going to have a predicted value for the, the NDVI based on the harmonic model, and we're going to call that you know, fitted uh, as a new band in the image. <coughs> if we were to plot that, in this case we get a pretty cosine curve, which, which you know, seems to match the data pretty well. Um, just as a final exercise here, what if we actually wanted to map the results? If we had uh, wanted to somehow show on the map what the um, the amplitude of variation was and what the phase of the variation is, where, where in the where in the year is the growing season beginning, or whatever the variation is caused by, a um, little bit of magic here. We decided to uh, work in a different color space called hue, saturation, and value. If you look at the color wheel. Um, we're going to map the the rotational angle, the hue, onto a uh, the phase information. <laughs> scale it to a, a plus minus pi range. Or, sorry, scale the plus minus pi that the phase comes in into a, a zero to one range. Uh, scale the uh, amplitude by you know, appropriate number for the color space here, and that's going to be the saturation, the degree of you know colorfulness of the color. A uh, zero saturation color is, is, trends towards gray and as you move you know, outwards in the cylinder uh, in the color space uh, you get a more brightly saturated color and the value we're going to keep as a constant. We then convert that back to RGB because the map needs an RGB value to actually show. Um, if you remember uh, from the previous slide with all the the algebra on it, there was a way of converting from the beta parameters back to amplitude and phase. Um, in earth engine notation, this looks, you know, again a bit backwards uh, of taking beta 3 and dividing it by beta 2 is beta 3 dot a times 2 of beta 2. Um, you, instead of a a function which took two parameters, it's the first parameter dot the function which takes the second parameter. It's a unusual postfix notation. Um, it happens the same way for uh, doing, you know, this is just a, you know, sum of squares, square root of that. So it's just a hypothesis, hypotenuse operation there to get that, and again, using the same cosine and sine parameters. Having recovered the phase and amplitude, yeah, we, we can plug it into RGB. What does this actually look like? Um, so this looks interesting. I'm going to zoom out a bit because it's going to tell us more. This map is uh, very dense, but uh, interesting to read. It's starting to show, first of all, you'll notice uh, variations in saturatedness of the color. Saturatedness, the, the brightness of the color in the, the built-up areas is, is very low. In the 
agricultural areas, it's a whole lot higher. And that's saying basically that buildings don't change over the year. Um, nothing grows on them most of the time. And uh, also there are interesting variations in the, the color. The, the yellow is a different start, different peak uh, of uh, NDVI value compared to with the NDVI around what looks like uh, reservoir shorelines and things like that have some seasonal variation in dam levels um, and that seasonal variation you know perhaps is at opposite phase to the, uh, the seasonal variation on NDVI and these kind of effects can be pulled out of the map. Okay, um, that wraps up what I wanted to talk about for uh, harmonic analysis. Yes, this code is, is as I described in the slides. Yeah, the chart is there too. Loving that chart. Um, all right. Uh, yes, and yeah, here's another. Uh, harmonic analysis chart of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area in this case. And again, you can see, in this case, very clearly, the built-up areas are pale and nothing changes there. The agricultural lands out here and the, uh, the bay shore, bay and wetlands, in fact, around here too, um, vary with a different phase. The grasslands in the valley here um, have seasonal variation, which is different from the agricultural variation out here. So, rich map, yes. I was just looking, so the variation in the mountain zone is always the cave. Yes. It's quite tricky because obviously shadows are. So to be shadows there. Um, so and maybe those have a seasonality effect too. Yes. Yeah. So if you're yeah. looking at. Um, yeah. You have to think about those. Yes. So yes, so it, it, it's. It would be whatever an artifact would be shadows. So sh shadow artifacts. Yes, which will have interesting seasonal effects too. Um, you would have to decide if you, you care about the mountain landscapes or, or not. But, and, and if that is your research focus, um, you may be able to do things with elevation models too if you knew the slope, which you can. You can even know the slope you know, direction. Um, you may be able to add some correction term for that. Uh, yeah. Change, yeah. Yes. Um, if you in, in fact, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting set of problems there. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome to the fun of remote sensing. Yeah. 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 Yes. The these two simple models you presented, yeah. you know, they you, you can fit the parameters because we can linearize linearize. Them. Yes. Is there a more general purpose kind of you know parameter estimation yeah. or do you have to be able to linearize your model? Um <coughs> Yes, there are a couple of big hammers if you want to do a general purpose thing, and they fit in under the general form of classification and machine learning models. Um, machine learning, um, which I'll be talking about next, is very much, I have some set of inputs, some set of outputs, fit whatever kind of model you can with as many, many parameters as you need to uh, build those predictions. Um, it's not as constrained a model as linear models where you the nice thing about linear model is you get a, a slope value out of it. You've got a rate of change, which may be meaningful in itself, just, just from the model. Um, I don't think we have any other direct, you know, simple regression algorithms to, to deal with uh, non-linearizable cases. Yeah, so it's like yeah, kind of yeah. talking about the yeah. non-linear parametric model yeah. that you want to fit. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, uh, I'll have to double check the docs, but I think we only have the, the linear one in the library right now. 
Back here, again. Yeah. It, it's it's not quite a Fourier transform. Okay, now you're testing me on my my linear algebra and, and analysis. Um, you know, it <laughs> make me think. Um, the, the, a, a general Fourier transform would start giving you. Um, direct estimates of the frequencies involved. It's not, you know, in, in this model here, we're assuming it's an annual variation and we're forcing the data to conform to an annual variation. If you were to do a Fourier transform on this, you, you'd get, you know, peaks at all the frequency bands and you could estimate that, you know, actually it's, it's a biannual variation or something like that. Um, Catch me later, but you know it, you, you're asking as hard a question as Glenn just asked it about uh, whether we have any other regression models which which will work in this context. Um, you may even be able to use machine learning if you if you want to do Fourier analysis because machine learning, um, if you have a completely connected network, is effectively doing a Fourier or can be trained to do a Fourier transform on the image as well. Okay, let's move on to uh, change detection. Okay, there's the change. Okay, this is going to be a, uh, a library of a few different uh, change detection algorithms. And uh, the example I'm going to work through, let me get it queued up for now. Uh, where is it? As again, it's in the demos repository. I'll just let it run because it'll take a little while to run. <coughs> okay, the, the first you know, change detection algorithm is, is perhaps the uh, perhaps a bit surprising at uh, first glance. Um, I've got a time series. And, uh, you know, I stack it all into one image. You know, these bands are from before the fire, let's say. These bands are from after the fire. I put all that time series in one image. And now I just use the classification algorithms and say, um, all these points are fire. All these points are not fire. Tell me... Uh, which of the point, you know, look at the changes in the image and um, see if you can predict fire just looking in the fact that things have changed. Okay, I, I said that all in one sentence. You're not doing any subtraction operation or before and after comparison. You, you're using the classifier directly to say, can you identify that this time series went from low value to high value or something like that? And uh, if I've labeled that as point of interest, as, as fire, let's say, build a predictor that will look for other time series and identify similar time series that have changed in the same way. Let me show you what that looks like on the map. OK, there's so many layers here, but uh, I'm going to Okay, that's what I wanted to show. Okay, I'll, I'll show the results and, and then go back into uh, looking at the code. So this is uh, west coast of South America, somewhere in Chile. Um, someone has hand labeled a, a recent burned area. And yeah, if you can take the map without the burned area. Well, in fact, yeah. That is the burned area, and you can see that the classifier is highlighted in dark. Pretty much the burned area. 
um, it's worked pretty well. Let's look at the direct classification in code, uh, this one. So another exercise in reading code. Um, we've got this stack of images, we've pulled out you know, all the bands from the for image, all the bands from the after image, and uh, one more band from the, uh, the fire polygon. Pick a bunch of points from the polygon using the sample operation, take an image and sample uh, within the bounds, 100 pixels. And this is the full claims detection algorithm then, using a classifier, using random forest in this case. Just look at all those sample points. Now, the sample points are going to have before bands, after bands, and is fire, yes or no. And say, can you build a predictor of is fire from just looking at the before bands and the after bands? And then if you run that classifier and add it back to the image, it directly predicts by uh, looking at the before and the after bands. <coughs> so a pretty simple way of doing change detection um, and actually remarkably effective in this case. The other thing you often want to do when, when running the classification is to uh, just look at the, 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 uh, the classification shift. Um, we were using this a little bit yesterday in the context of seeing how accurate um, the classifiers that Nadu built were. Um, it, it, instead of using t training and test sets here, we can use before set and after set and, and use the same uh, error matrix uh, arithmetic to see how things have changed. Let's go with that. So we've built up a uh, before set and after set with this classified before and classified later. We um, tell it to build an error matrix of just using the bands which have been stacked into before and after. Um, into that matrix and let's look at it. So we've sampled 100 points using sample again and of those 100 points most fit comfortably down the diagonal and in fact three fit outside the diagonal. We, we've sampled, even if it's a large burned area we have very few in the, in the transition like that. Okay um, I'm standing between people and coffee, but we have a, a couple more examples here. <coughs> Simple subtraction works, works pretty well too. So take those two image bands, time zero and time one, do a subtraction. This algorithm is very easy to, uh, to write. Um, often though, when you want to subtract, you won't want to subtract the, the raw RGB bands. It makes you have to choose the the index that you of you know BERT index or anything you're doing um, appropriately for the task at hand. In this case, we're using a a burn ratio function, which is a function of the infrared bands and a thermal band too. Um, having set up the uh, the burn ratio function, um, in fact, uh, I'll do an aside here. Um, if you have complicated arithmetic you want to do on bands, the, the examples I've been showing so far are being these dot multiply, dot add, dot subtract, complicated sets of uh, you know, chained functions. In this case, I've built up a single string. It's two lines added together, um, which looks like a far more you know, readable function. And as your uh, operations get more complicated, this can, becomes a very handy technique. I've had to do two things. I need to provide this expression um, using regular infix notation uh, and then I need to say what NIR, SWIR and thermal actually are and I provide this in a dictionary as a second parameter saying NIR is select the, sec the, the band 5 and so on. So this lets this expression in total lets me uh, do pretty elaborate evaluations um, and apply 
some complicated formula to multiple bands in the image. <coughs> Having done the NBR function, I'm applying it to both the before and the after image, and then all I need to do is subtract. If I look at what this layer looks like on the map, uh, let's take that one instead. Take that off. We get something which is um, actually an inverse image, as it turns out, but again, pretty accurately identifies burn ratio. The, the, the darker ones, maybe because I have the subtraction backwards, are the, are the actual burned areas in this case. Um, more linear algebra, uh, more fun with linear algebra. Um, if I have two points, two points in color space with you know, multi-band multi, multi images, um, I can ask directly, are these points different? Uh, and one you know, perhaps naive way of determining whether two points are different is just to subtract them in, in image space. You do a, a norm operation, subtract point one from point two. If it was in three dimensions, you'd have these two vectors in three dimensional space, and you just have the, the Euclidean distance between those two vectors. Um, the, uh, the other way, and perhaps a little bit more principled, is instead of subtracting, you compute the angle between the two vectors. You don't care how much, how you know, large and absolute value the, you know, the red, green, and blue bands are, um, but you uh, want to know normalizing red bands, red, green, and blue to a constant value, and compare it to the point in the other space. What, how much the angle shifts? So if two uh, two pixels were exactly the same, only one was sli slightly higher intensity than the other. The angle between those two pixels would be, be zero um, because they uh, are really both pointing in the same direction. If, if um, two pixels are, you know, one is all red and one is all blue, it will be along this axis and this axis, and the angle would be a, a maximum of 90 degrees. Let's compare those two on the map. So, uh, okay, I'm setting the opacity to zero here, so we'll see the spectral distance first. I'm going to drop the opacity of this one a bit so we see the phi area spectral distance. Um, works fairly well identifying the phi area. Spectral angle is, okay, sliding back and forth to do a comparison. Pretty similar. Uh, you can see some artifacts outside the fire area which behave differently in the spectral angle or spectral distance metrics. Um, it will depend a lot on your, your use case whether one or the other works better for, for your kind of uh, vegetation situations. Um, okay, I'll put it directly in the, in the in the deck here, so just so that we can do a, a quick comparison between the two. And spectral angle seems to be a stronger signal. It is the one thing you get a much brighter white coming out of that uh, to compare the, the changes there. Okay, now that's, that's, that's the end of my library of, you know, somewhat scattered. I apologize for different kind of change detection techniques. I hope some half of them are, are, are useful and applicable. Um, any questions about change detection methods? Okay then, um, catch me later if you have questions and let's break for coffee. Um, we'll be back here at uh, 11 o'clock for the next session. Thank you.